Hey, what is up guys? We are back with the second episode of the Ultimate Guitar Lesson. I asked you guys to leave comments on a video a couple weeks ago asking any questions you have regarding your guitar playing, any advice you want, and you guys left a lot of questions, which is amazing, so thank you to everyone who participated. I think today it's at like 100 comments. So I'm gonna try my best to get through as many as we can, but obviously I can't answer all of them. I'm also gonna try to keep my answers short and sweet but also give like full in-depth answers. So we'll see how that goes and how many we're able to get through. Really quick before we get started, if you guys haven't checked it out already, I started a Patreon page a couple weeks ago and for a few bucks a month, you guys get the tabs to a lot of my videos, backing tracks, MP3 downloads, exclusive lessons. So if you guys are interested in that content or just wanna support the channel, check it out and I really do appreciate everyone who signed up already. It allows me to spend more time making videos like this one. And one other quick cool thing is I just added this t-shirt you can see here to my merch store, which I think is kind of cool and I want to try to come up with more fun designs like this. So if you guys think it's cool and you want to check it out, I'll leave a link in the description below. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. All right, so first question, it says congratulations because I posted this to celebrate the milestone of hitting 90,000 subscribers, which is amazing. So thanks again, guys, for everyone who's joined the channel. It's super cool and amazing to me that so many of you have uh, come along for the ride. So congratulations, as a beginner guitarist, what are some important things that should be learned to develop a good foundation? For example, there's chords, chord progression, scales, music theory, rhythm, learning songs, with so much to learn, it can be a bit overwhelming when starting out. Absolutely. This is obviously where having a teacher can help and come into play because they can kind of provide a, a path or a roadmap for you to go down. But I think you mentioned a lot of the important things. Typically, what I would do with students who start from scratch with me, first, we just learn some fun melodies and whatever music they're interested in, that's where we're going to learn the stuff, whether it's pop or metal or country, anything in between. We just try to learn some fun single note melodies just to get your fingers moving around the fretboard, using all four fingers, finding your frets, finding your strings, just becoming a little comfortable with where the notes are. Now from there, then I get into open chords and just learning your you know, basic uh, open chords. When I show them to students, there's nine chords that I include. And with those nine chords, it's just incredible the amount of music that you're able to play. Kind of your, uh, you know, campfire chords or cowboy chords, they're called. Again, you can play, you know, uh, the majority of music that you hear on the radio that way. And then from there, what I would do is try to tie it all together by learning some songs that you're into and it can be any style of music. And again, that's where having a teacher can come into play because they know the level of difficulty and searching for that on your own is difficult because you're not sure if it's a little uh, too advanced or not, but you wanna look for songs that kind of tie those two techniques together and would have some single note melodies also some open chords, maybe some power chords thrown in there. And then you are trying to work on your rhythm and your timing because the ultimate goal is to try to play with the song and see if you can work up to full speed and uh, play along to it. All right, second question. And uh, I, I, I love all these different types of questions. So this one says, congrats, I have a question. Are you naturally red haired or do you dye your beard? Looks very good. Uh, yes, this is 100% natural. And I take it as a compliment if you think it's dyed, that it looks, uh, you know, enhanced or whatever. But uh, yes, absolutely uh, 100%. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, next question, back to a guitar question. Uh, hey, Jamie, I really like the way that you improvise and write your solos, and I'd really appreciate it if you could show how to improvise better and make my improvising sound more soloing. Yeah, this is a great question and one that I get often. Improvising is like everything else on the guitar. The more you practice it, the more time you spend doing it, the better you're gonna get, the more ideas you're gonna come up with and uh, different ways to approach things. I do think it's also a huge benefit Benefit to learn a bunch of material from your favorite guitar players. You do become kind of like a melting pot of ideas with taking influence from many different players. And it's not at all uh, plagiarism. You know, everybody does it and every great guitar player has their influences that 
they learn from because you're just not going to think of all the ideas on your own. You have to kind of see what other players do. Now, one thing that I suggest to make your improvising, you know, sound more musical and it sounds very simple, but it's actually very difficult to do. And that is you have to pay such attention to what you're improvising over. You have to listen to the track um, and play to the track. You have to really kind of get in the zone with it. And this is obviously where, you know, if you're practicing over a backing track, having an inspiring, motivating backing track can make a big difference. Instead of being too caught up with what you're trying to do, what scale you're trying to use or what lick you're trying to throw in or what you've been practicing recently, you have to really listen to the track and play to what you're hearing. Are the drums building up intensity? Is it dynamically, you know, uh, calming down a little bit? Because that should all influence how you're playing and how you're responding to the track. It's kind of like a dialogue and you're trying to, you know, have a conversation with the background music instead of just a monologue where you're too concerned about just what you want to say musically. All right, here's a great question. How do I respond to unexpected out of key or random chords in a chord progression while improvising? Now, this is a pretty difficult thing to do. This is where ear training uh, comes into play. If, as you said, unexpected, you're not knowing that that chord is coming around where you can plan for it or know what scale you're gonna use over that chord. If it's unexpected, you're going completely by ear trying to recognize what it is and then also have the theory information to know what you're able to use over top of that and to take it to the next level kind of like a professional level would be like what to use what to play to tie that chord closer together with the stuff that you were just playing over if that makes sense let's say you're playing in d major and then it throws in a random chord from d minor you know is there a part of the scale or intervals notes you can use that actually tie those two chords together so it seems less random it's your job in the melody to kind of tie those things together and make it sound more cohesive all right, I have to add this one in just because it's hilarious. Hello, my question is how do I get my beard to look this clean while playing guitar? Thank you in advance. Now, again, I really actually love these comments that I get because I do maintain my beard myself. Uh, and I, you know, I take a lot of pride in trying to make it uh, look nice. But there's also, you know, just some uh, secrets and tricks to the trade that I'm just not going to share with you guys today. So, but thanks again. All right, another great question, uh, non-beard related is, uh, congrats, I just had a question, how do I get faster at hammer-ons and pull-offs with my pinky? This is a great question. What I do with my students for hammer-ons and pull-offs or legato playing is you want to practice more in an endurance way, uh, not so much a speed way. And how you would do that is uh, it's a different uh, method of practicing, a different style of practicing compared to a lot of other techniques. What you would want to do is start with some trills that you actually play for a certain amount of time. So you would time yourself for uh, you know, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 25, 30 seconds, and do these trills. Again, for a specific amount of time, and 15 seconds doesn't sound like a long time, but when you're doing these fast trills, 15 seconds is like the longest 15 seconds of your life at first, when you're first getting used to it. And then you wanna go between the different uh, fingers. So going, and then you would get to the pinky. Now the point is you do want the trill to be really fast, but still to a point that you're controlling it, that you can hear all the notes nice and clear, the notes are nice and hard, and you're not kind of dying, dying out where you can't really hear anything. You want, you want it nice and loud. That will help with your speed because if you can do it at a fast trill pace for 30 seconds, which is probably unlikely in a song that you're going to play, then that means you can do it comfortably really fast for a few seconds or up to five seconds or something like that. So use a stopwatch and go through the different uh, fingering options and, and you can root it off the second finger too, second and third, second and pinky. 
and then the torturous uh, third and pinky, <laughs> which is really hard to do, but really great for your left hand technique. All right, here's another amazing question. Any help with memorizing the fretboard would be greatly appreciated. So this is actually something I was meaning to make a video on uh, and maybe still will. This is uh, how I approach it with my students to start to know where the notes are on the fretboard. Now, one thing I always tell students is if you can quickly find the notes, so if I say on the fourth string play a G sharp or a C or any note, if you can quickly get there within a couple seconds, then that's awesome. And I really don't think you're at any major disadvantage compared to someone who just knows it off the top of their head like that. Unless, you know, you're playing in a pit band of an orchestra or something like that where it will really matter. For most of us, uh, using those two seconds is totally fine. So how I would practice that is uh, if you're unfamiliar with the concept, you just take the musical alphabet, what which I call it, a to G sharp, and you just use the starting note of each string and count from there. So if I have the low E, then in the musical alphabet it goes to F next on the first fret, and then F sharp on the second, G, G sharp, after G sharp you're back to A, A sharp, B, no B sharp, so it goes to C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and you're back to E at the 12th fret. So usually I just kind of, uh, have my students concerned about open to 12th fret at first because it just repeats afterwards and then you can always kind of add that afterwards. Any note down here 12 frets higher is always the same note. So what I would do is take that musical alphabet each day for a few minutes and just choose a note at random so let's say C sharp and try to find your C sharps on all six strings going down and the thing is you can hear that they all sound the same if your guitar is in tune. <laughs> And then you would choose a different note, so let's say F, and try to play your Fs. Now, the nice thing about this method is that if you do get one wrong, you can kind of hear it. That's an F sharp. That note is right beside the one that I was going for, but you can hear it sticks out and it doesn't sound very nice with the other ones. So without having to use a tuner or anything like that, you can kind of fact check yourself as you're going down the fretboard. You do that for a few minutes each day. You will start to memorize where certain checkpoints are on the fretboard. You won't memorize all the notes at first, but you'll start to memorize certain notes. Like let's say if you have A on the low E string at the fifth fret, you start to memorize that that's there, then that just gives you another point that you can count from. So if I say, let's play B, A, A sharp B, you can get there even quicker than always having to count from open or back from the 12th fret. Here's another great question that actually ties in with that last question and uh, the video that I will probably end up making on the channel here is, is it recommended to memorize the notes on the fretboard or are there better ways to memorize the fretboard? So I do think it's important to memorize the notes on the fretboard or at least just, again, be really familiar with most of them. But there is a method that I think is even better and superior to learning the notes on the fretboard and that is learning your intervals on the fretboard. This in one way can be harder but also in another way it can be easier if that's possible and what I mean is if I'm playing a B note on the second string at the 12th fret that's great to know that it's a B note but when but when it comes to improvising and when it comes to writing solos and stuff like that it's more important or it can be more beneficial to know how that note relates to the key that you're in or the chords that you're over. So if I'm in the key of E minor, that B note is going to have a different relation to the key than if I'm in uh, D major. That same B note is going to have a different relation in that key. As an example, going with intervals, if it's in E minor, the B would be my perfect fifth of the key. Or if I'm in D major, the B would be my sixth of the key. That does really make a difference when it comes to improvising because when you're making those decisions of sounds you're looking for or uh, harmonies that you're looking for, it's good to know what intervals you're trying to reach. The part of it that is easier is that your intervals typically stay in the same spot. So as a quick example, if I take like the pentatonic scale, you know that second note in a minor pentatonic is always your minor third. 
And so the easy part of this is that anytime you move around your pentatonic to any key, that second note in the pentatonic is always your minor third. So the intervals stay in the same spots as you move into different keys, but it's really helpful to figure out what they are. The way that I think as I'm improvising is if I'm in the key of E minor, and then it goes to a C chord. I now can uh, make a decision as to which notes I want to play over that C chord knowing how it relates to the C. Is it in the chord? Is it an extension of the chord? So that B note that I used earlier over a C chord is your major seven. And so I can go into this in more detail in another video, but playing a C chord and then playing a B note over top almost creates a major seven chord. So these are the types of decisions that I can make while I'm improvising to get certain sounds and certain harmonies. You guys have been asking some really great questions. So here's the next one. It says, hey, I love your videos, man. Thank you, I appreciate it. I would love to know what would be the best way to do ear training to connect your ear brain fingers to the guitar so when you hear something in your head you know what note to press and where. So yeah kind of going along th these questions are kind of uh, <laughs> tying in together which is nice but with ear training what I would do is start off definitely with just intervals. So take like a major scale and just try to hear and try to recognize the different intervals so that if I play a C note and then in my major scale if I play a perfect fifth or I play a perfect fourth can you recognize the difference and can you hear which one it is without you know looking at the guitar or anything like that and then start to move them around the fretboard so hearing that interval versus right one was a perfect fifth one was a perfect fourth being able to recognize that so that you can hear the distance between notes. And then you want to do that with all of the intervals. So the minor intervals, the perfect, the diminished, augmented, all 12 notes you want to be able to recognize off of the first note. So after you're pretty comfortable with recognizing intervals, then you can start with simple little melodies and try to just train your ear and uh, figure them out. And then I would move on to chords and identifying different types of chords and also chord progressions so that you could actually hear a one, four, five progression or a two five one and and try to differentiate a minor six chord from a minor second chord and it just takes practice takes a lot of practice and my ear has become so much better over the years because of teaching because every single day I have students bringing in music that they're wanting to learn and I have to learn it really quick to be able to teach it to them within the lesson so with a ton of practice like that your ear gets pretty sharp all right here's a technique question when alternate picking three notes fast on a a string how do you transition strings effectively without everything sounding messy it's a great question and it's a practical question because a lot of scale shapes that we would use would be three notes per string um, other than you know pentatonic and chromatic and stuff like that so a lot of times if you're sticking to your diatonic modes or scales then you're going to be playing three notes per string and that does make it tricky for your picking now there's two methods here if you're like me who is a strict alternate picker then you're going to alternate pick everything, meaning every downstroke is going to be followed by an upstroke if you're playing consistently. If you have a consistent rhythm going, then every downstroke is followed by an up. So whether you're staying on the same string or you're moving between strings, so if I play three notes and then go to the next string, I have to, if I'm alternate picking, I have to attack that string up. which is tricky because you have to go over the string first to then pick it up. Now, it seems a little inefficient, but the benefit to that technique is that you can maintain your rhythm because you're feeling this motion. as you're picking the notes and you're, it's a little bit easier, at least for me to keep the rhythm, the momentum. Now the other method, which I don't use very much or at all, is economy picking. Where economy picking, you would start each string in the direction that you're going. If you're playing down the strings, 
then you would start each string with a downstroke, even if you just did a downstroke. It does make it more efficient, and you can look at guys like Frank Gambali and even uh, Igwe Malmsteen, I believe, is an economy picker, actually. And you can see this just incredibly smooth, efficient uh, motion in the right hand. But for me, I like to have that... that sense of rhythm in my right hand. So here's a great question, which I think was a similar one from the last video, but an excellent topic to go over. Starts with congratulations, man, thank you. I am an intermediate player and I just want to ask what is the best roadmap for me to become an advanced player, mainly on techniques? Like, do I need to practice alternate picking first, then legato and so on? Thank you for the response. It's a great question. If you're looking to become an advanced, you know, uh, professional level guitar player, you need to be working on all the different things of your playing every day. And it's just, that's the way it is. That's the difference between someone who just kind of plays for fun and plays professionally, is the amount of time put in with the guitar, the amount of practice, and you know, a lot of the stuff that might not be the most exciting to practice. You know, like I remember I used to follow Steve Vai's uh, guitar workout that was posted in uh, Guitar World magazine back in the day. You had to spend an hour a day on scales an hour a day on chords, just a, a full hour just on chords and getting familiar with your chords as much as possible. An hour on ear training, an hour on technique and so on and it, and it went on. So within that hour of technique, it's very important to touch on the different techniques. You would spend some time on your you know, fretting hand legato stuff, and then you would spend some time on your picking and just having better control. You would spend time on sweep picking, uh, it could include economy picking, tapping, all this different stuff, like every technique you can think of basically. You do wanna to try to practice it a little bit each day. Now, you don't have to spend that much time every single day doing it, but you do wanna just try to hit on those different things a little bit each day. All right, here's another great question. It says, right now I am focusing mostly on technique and speed. Can you explain how to reach that crazy shred speeds and how to practice correctly to get results as soon as possible? Is there a certain different feeling when you play faster Thank you for the content. Well, you're very welcome. It's a great question. So with getting to you know fast speeds and being able to play fast, the good news is I think everyone can get there. So I, I've never met a student or anyone that I would say, you're just not gonna be able to play fast. <laughs> everyone can get there. The difference is, is who spends the amount of time to get there, right? And also the patience in the journey to get there. The way to practice speed, whether it's sweep picking or alternate picking or tapping, any any speed stuff, you wanna work with a metronome, 100%. With the metronome, you're able to track your progress so you know how fast you're playing it. And then you're also able to see if you're in time and locking in with the rhythm. Just a quick answer is what I would do is take an exercise, whether it's like a chromatic, <laughs> Or it could be a pentatonic scale, three note per string. A anything like that, any small exercise, and actually play it to a metronome in the different subdivisions, meaning play it in like eighth notes, two notes per beat, then play it in triplets, three notes per beat, 16th notes, four notes per beat, and you could keep going to see where you kind of max out, but playing the same exercise in the different rhythmic subdivisions is an excellent way to practice speed. So it's not just always 16th notes or it's not always eighth notes. And one thing, one strong suggestion to stay away from with the metronome is you don't want to practice everything in quarter notes, meaning that if you're practicing fast, you don't want the metronome doing a click for every single note you're playing because the whole point with the metronome is to pace yourself. So if the metronome is doing this, can you actually pace yourself correctly to fit six notes within those beats or four notes within those beats? It can be much more challenging that way, but it's also more practical because if you're playing with a band or something like that, you're gonna feel that beat and it's up to you to play those correct rhythms and you're not gonna have someone, the drummer or someone, doing that to help you out of how fast you're supposed to play. So I would spend a little bit of time with the metronome every single day and keep in mind within say a week of practice, if you can increase the metronome five BPM, 10 BPM, say you're playing triplets or 16th notes, that's a good amount of progress within a week. And if you add that up you know, consistently over two months, 
that's also a lot of speed in a short amount of time. So it's really hard if you're not practicing with a metronome to track any sort of progress because if I play something fast today, and then by the time I come back to it tomorrow and I'm going, it will be so hard to remember, like, is that faster than I was playing it yesterday? Is it still in time? How much faster is it? Because you do want to increase at small increments so that you're maintaining the technique and the consistency and the rhythm, all of that stuff, it comes before speed. You have to make sure everything else is solid before you start speeding it up because you'd still want it to sound nice when it's fast. Here's a fun question. I'd like to know how to make the pull off run on your DJ Khaled video so clear. I'm not sure if it's my fingering or whatnot, but it's hard to make the same sound as you when switching strings after the first pull off. So that's a good question. You're referring to my, uh, what DJ Khaled thought he sounded like, uh, video, which is funny enough, definitely my most viral video I've ever done. And it was kind of a fun, you know, little one off one night. So I'm glad you guys like it. So to answer the technique question with pull offs, and I'm going to include hammer ons in the answer just because it's a similar technique, you want to make sure you're doing them very hard. So when you're doing pull offs, and it's actually good to practice pull offs, either on a clean tone, or turn down your electric guitar all the way and see if you can still hear Hopefully the microphone's picking that up, but you can hear the notes nice and loud still. So you're not getting the help from distortion or the amp or anything like that. With pull-offs and hammer-ons, you just want to make sure they're really hard so that they sound almost as loud as if you pick the notes. The mistake most people make with pull-offs is they just let go. And maybe with distortion, you'd still hear it a little bit, but the note's not going to have that nice, strong tone and clarity. If you pick or if you pull off nice and hard and same with hammer-ons, I don't think there's such thing as too hard for a hammer-on. You want to aim through the string and have that note really nice and loud. And then the final thing with the pull-offs, just make sure when you're pulling off, you actually do pick the first note of each string. So as I'm going, I believe that was the run that I did. I, I'm picking the first note of each string and then I'm relying on my left hand to flick off each note so that it's nice and loud. Also having the next note already in place so that when I flick off the finger, it's already there and there's not any of this kind of jumping between notes, uh, which will stop the consistency. Here's a really great question. How do you approach playing to chord changes? So I'm, uh, I go two ways on this, to be honest. I think it's really good to know how to play over changes, to know, as I said earlier, what you know uh, interval you're playing over the chord and to know really what you're doing at all times. But at the same time, I try to not let that ever restrict me into what I can or should play. What I mean by that is I'm not always, you know, trying to carefully follow the chord tones of all the chords in the progression because I, I feel like that's going to restrict me and I'm always going to be kind of thinking of, well, I got to hit this note next on the next chord and I'm not in the moment of trying to play the best thing that I can make right then and there. And then once that chord changes, then I respond to that and play to that chord. So again, I do think it's great to, you know, know the theory, learn the theory so that you know what the changes are, how they relate to each other. And especially if the chords are not in the same key, if you're going between two different chords, that are in opposite keys or just different keys, then you definitely have to follow the changes and you know play one scale over this chord and another scale over that chord. That's a little bit different, but if you're in the same key the entire time, I kind of like to sometimes forget about that kind of stuff because a lot of people get caught up playing the chord tones, meaning that if it's a, a C chord that's built of C, E, and G, it's like, well, I have to hit one of those three notes over that chord. And they will work, they'll sound amazing, they'll match up with it, 
perfectly, but sometimes it's really nice to play a second or a seventh or even the sixth or fourth, you know, any of the other notes uh, that you could play over that chord that are not from that chord. And it can create a little bit of tension or, you know, further harmonize the chord that way. So you don't want to restrict yourself to, uh, I can, I only play these notes over these chords, but it is really good to know if it's a second or a third or a fourth and have that knowledge. A question similar to earlier is the question is how can I speed up my left hand? What can I do to play fast solos and some licks? Tried to play them slowly then faster and faster but I'm thinking I have something like hand speed limit. Thank you for inspiring. So similar answer to earlier, if you're specifically talking about uh, your left hand, which I assume is your fretting hand, you wanna practice pure left hand technique, legato technique, do those trills as I mentioned earlier. To take it even further, uh, you wanna practice like legato lines. <laughs> and trying to build those up and speed them up. But you can also practice kind of in between scale runs and trills for an extended period of time. So like 15 seconds, 20 seconds of. Change the fingering. Try to get a stretch in there. And you want to focus entirely on your left hand as you're doing that. You're picking the first note of each new string that you go to, uh, just to kind of you know help the technique. But it's really good to divide the hands that way for a lot of techniques, and just purely focus on one hand over the other before trying to combine them. So if you're doing like uh, you know fast scale runs that you're picking through, you want to see if both hands are at the same level or if one is holding you back. All right, next question. I was wondering if you have any tips for a guitarist looking to make similar content to you. Love the videos and playing, keep it up. Thank you. Yeah, so I've only been doing the content stuff for just over a year and a half now. And I'm still, you know, learning new stuff all the time and researching things for uh, whether it's lighting and cameras and recording and all that kind of stuff. I think my biggest suggestion would be just make the content that you really love to make uh, the most enjoyable stuff because behind the scenes, it is a lot of work and, and you know, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into it. So you have to make sure you're really enjoying it. So whatever it is, uh, whether it's playing or reviews or gear or just, you know, lesson stuff, anything that you really enjoy making content of, then yeah, go ahead and do it. And I think, you know, most YouTubers would say the same thing where audio is probably even more important than video. The first year or so, so with my stuff, I actually just used my iPhone for the video and it was okay, but now I've upgraded to a better camera and, and stuff like that. But the audio was always important and to make sure it's clear and sounding professional. Next question, how do you recommend intermediate players to get out of a rut? I know basic theory, I can play pentatonic, major and minor scales all over the neck. I can play major and minor arpeggios, but I've been in a rut for a while. What should I practice next? And how can I feel like I'm making progress as a musician? That's a good question. So a lot of the stuff you mentioned that you know is more of a theory uh, basis, which is amazing and you wanna know those things. And you know, it's a big uh, hurdle to get to those things, but you have to remember that you know whether it's theory or technique those are just tools as to use as a musician they don't really um, you know they're they're not the most important thing if that makes sense so whether it's building up your technique or your theory knowledge you only want to use it as a tool for expression one thing that I find a lot of players don't do enough of is learning music is learning songs and having songs that are a good challenge for them to learn and the ultimate goal with them always especially with my students is to try to play with the song because I find a lot of guitar players make the mistake of learning something to like 70% where they kind of know how it goes or maybe they have to look at the tabs again and I kind of know how it's played it's something like this versus like really knowing the song and I always use the example where if you got a phone call from a cover band saying hey we're playing you know next week and we're doing that song like do you know it well enough to be able to fill in and play it that way that's how well you need to know the song fully memorized start to finish play with the track almost as if you were the guitar player in the band so finding fun music to learn and challenging music to learn is always a fun way to get out of a rut and especially trying stuff from players or bands that are new to you or just different styles and stuff just to, you know, get you doing different things is a great way to get out of a rut. 
Here's a technique question. Need lesson on clean sweeps and fast and clean alternate picking, please. I can do those, but mine are not that clean. How can I improve? Uh, here's a big suggestion actually is make sure you practice both of those things with distortion. Do not practice them on a clean sound or especially unplugged. A lot of guitar players make the mistake of practicing unplugged. You are not going to hear if there's any excess noise uh, going on, but distortion is going to let you know. You have to make sure you're practicing with distortion so that you're really focusing on muting the strings with both hands and trying to get the notes really nice and clear. So sweep picking is a, a technique that takes a long time to get really fluent with. I know for myself it took at least a year, probably longer than a year to really get, you know, comfortable and fluent with arpeggios up and down the fretboard. So be patient with it and make sure you're practicing these things slow. If you're speeding up and it's starting to get sloppy and it's getting really noisy, you have to bring down the tempo and get it nice and clean, locked in rhythmically and stuff like that, and then just slowly work your way up. It's a tedious way of practicing, but it really is the only way to get there when you hear, you know, the great guitar players playing uh, super fast, clean runs as they do. <laughs> Here's a great question. How do I record a difficult solo or riff with as little takes as possible? And the reason I'm laughing is I wish I knew the answer. I, you know, if, if you figure it out, you let me know because uh, there's definitely some days where it, I may post something on YouTube that you see and there's like 30 takes uh, before that that I'm unhappy with and it's just not going well. Or even like a day or two earlier of, you know, shooting the video and recording it and none of it is you know worth posting in my opinion so it's it's something that everyone struggles with and one thing I heard recently that actually made me personally feel a lot better was I was watching an interview with Joe Satriani where he was talking about how him after all these years of playing and and how incredible he is as a guitar player he was in the studio one day recording a single solo the same solo for the same song and I I guess he likes to have some uh, element of improvisation in his playing because it's not a rehearsed solo that way but he said he was in the studio recording it for six hours that day and he said none of it was usable the producer said it wasn't the, the best he wasn't happy with it and that's Joe Satriani so it really just goes to show that it does happen to everyone and you can have off days and stuff like that sometimes you just find that it you know comes together on certain days. I did that video where I did the shred version of Hotel California and it's funny because I tried recording some of that the night before and it was not working. It was just not flowing. I almost gave up on the idea and then the next morning I just came back to it because I, I thought it was a funny idea and it started to really flow and I like really quickly set up the camera and just recorded it because it was working. So a lot of those uh, takes you see in that video are like first or second take because of I'm just trying to like get it out so it does happen to everybody here's a great question that I feel a lot of guitar players always want to know is how to get out of the pentatonic shape when improvising on a solo first I would say try to get as familiar as you can with the pentatonic and especially moving it around the fretboard can you play a minor pentatonic from open to 22 or 24th fret at that point then you can go outside of pentatonic and get beyond the pentatonic scale but you do want to try to get as much out of it as possible first because i find if you're learning more complex theory or more sophisticated scales if you can't make the pentatonic sound really good then learning those skills is not going to help now if you are good with the pentatonic then i would get into your diatonic modes and i would learn you know the minor scale and the major scale but then all seven modes and practice them across the fretboard but also use them individually over a dorian backing track you can get away with using the pentatonic scale it will sound great but if you can use the dorian mode the dorian scale that can make it sound a lot more interesting a lot more flavorful and give you a lot of new inspiration so try to get used to each of the modes individually as well here's a question similar to what i was talking about earlier how do i stick with a song because i'll learn a lick or part of a solo then drop it not because it's too hard or anything but because i'm bored and i just forget about it it's a really good question that's why uh, sometimes it's good you know to have lessons and a teacher and stuff because it does kind of hold you accountable that you have to you know get that song down by the next lesson or the lesson after that or something like that but i do heavily suggest trying to have songs from time to time that you really get down start to finish you know the entire thing it's memorized as I said earlier you could join a cover band on stage and you know the song 
and you don't have to have the tabs in front of you or kind of know how it goes. It's, it's really, really good. So the most important thing though is it has to be songs that you really love, right? I would never force a student to practice a song for a month and a half if they're not loving the song, right? Or it's not uh, a favorite of theirs. So just, you know, find the music that you really love, but then try to choose a song to really get down, whether it takes you a couple weeks or a couple months. Have that kind of discipline so that you really get it all the way down. All right, last question and a good one, how to improvise in the pentatonic scale. Now it can sound like a kind of basic question in a way, just because most guitar players are familiar with the pentatonic scale. But I do think a lot of guitar players don't really push the pentatonic scale as far as it can go. To give you an example, I was learning a part of a Jason Becker solo the other day, and there were these crazy, you know, sweep picking shapes. And at first I did not recognize the shapes he was using at all, and I'm trying to figure out what chords he's representing. Is it a sus4? Is he adding in the nine? All this stuff. And then when I when it finally dawned on me, I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is the pentatonic scale. Like he's he's doing these crazy stretched out sweeping versions of pentatonic shapes. It made me laugh because that's like total Jason Becker where it's like the most terrifying lick with the most basic of scales. And I just love the irony of that. But it just goes to show that, you know, if you're not pushing your pentatonic to that limit, then you just have not reached the end of what you can do with it. I would spend a lot of time just using the pentatonic scale and just really trying to get as much out of it as possible because, you know, I've been playing many, many years and I play every single day. I'm still coming up with new things with the pentatonic scale that are, you know, new ideas or just new ways of looking at things, new ways to approach it on the fretboard. There's just, you know, countless things you can do with it that goes, you know, far beyond the kind of, you know, classic rock bluesy playing if you were to apply some crazy techniques to it where you're you know trying to like sweep through different pentatonic shapes or you're tapping extending the scale across you're playing the scale three notes per string you're doing string skipping within the pentatonic scale all that kind of stuff like you can just keep pushing and pushing and pushing it um, and also of course get familiar with it from you know the beginning of the neck to the end i'm a huge believer in that that you have to really try to get as much out of the scale as possible before trying to uh, use theory or more sophisticated scales to sound more interesting. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this video. I always find these incredibly fun to do. So thanks again to everyone for your questions. Sorry if I didn't answer one of your questions, but there's just too many to answer without this video being like five hours long. I'll probably do another one soon and, and we'll keep this going as a series every couple months or so. Again, if you guys want more exclusive content and especially lesson stuff, check out the Patreon page for a few bucks a month. I really do appreciate everyone who signed up so far and I can't thank you enough for the support. Let me know if you found any of these answers helpful in the comments and as always guys the most important thing keep up the practice.